Good evening. Welcome to the Institute of Politics. Uh, the man who you're going to hear from tonight needs no introduction, although he'll get one in a minute. Uh, but the story that he's written uh, is one that, particularly for students who are here, uh, but also for those who lived through it, is one of the great dramas of our time, the year 1968. And we in Chicago have particular memories uh, of that year, uh, given the, the, the centrality of our city uh, to uh, the, the story of the 2000, of the 19, 2000, of the 1968 uh, election. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, ne next, <coughs> excuse me, next Wednesday, January 31st, we're hosting a screening of the film All the Way, not irrelevant to the discussion you're going to hear tonight, and it will be followed uh, by a discussion with uh, the film's director, Jay Roach, so I uh, encourage you to find out more about this. Uh, uh, on our uh, on our website politics.uchicago.edu, uh, you can also follow there and elsewhere details of our fifth anniversary celebration on February seventh. Uh, our guest will be Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada. Uh, so uh, uh, details of that will be uh, forthcoming. Uh, as usual, we will be uh, inviting questions. We'll give priority uh, to, uh, for the first three questions at least, to uh, student, uh, student questions. I want to remind you, as I always do, that, question marks end with, uh, that questions end with a question mark. Um, please make sure your phones are silent and uh, the restrooms are on the first floor for those who aren't familiar with uh, the Quad Club. And now uh, to formally introduce our speaker is Anais Rosenblatt. Uh, Anais is a third year student from Boca Raton, Florida. She's studying political science and this year she is the president of the University of Chicago Democrats. Please, joining, uh, please join me in welcoming Anais to the platform. Hello and welcome. My name is Anais and I am the president of the University of Chicago Democrats. Today we welcome our guest, Lawrence O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell's political career ranges from writing for the New York Times and Washington Post to former chief of staff on the Senate Finance Committee to Emmy award-winning executive producer and writer of The West Wing. Today we will be speaking about his account of the 1968 election from his new book, Playing with Fire, the 1968 election and the transformation of American politics. According to Mr. O'Donnell, this tumultuous election, impacted by disloyalty, dirty tricks, assassination, and riots, created American politics as we know them today, and it continues to be a fascination for him. Moderating the discussion is James Warren, chief media writer for the Pointer Institute and former managing editor and Washington bureau chief for the Chicago Tribune. Please welcome James Warren and Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, absolute pleasure, and it, we're, we're uh, absolutely a tickle pink to essentially be serving as, you know, David's warm-up act for Justin Trudeau <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Uh, so uh, st stick around. Um, and uh, I apologize to Lawrence for Chicago area MSNBC ratings being precipitously down in the next hour, hour and a half, uh, <laughs> given the huge crowd that's, uh, that's been uh, lured here. Um, let's go right to the book, and, and primarily for those who aren't as familiar with an astonishingly eventful year. I was in high school in New York City at the time and protesting on various matters. Um, for those not quite as familiar, why don't you give us sort of the cable news two, three minute quickie summary about the backdrop of this book? I thought this was the spot where I was going to be able to talk for longer than two or three minutes. <laughs> do you have a commercial coming? This is, uh, uh, no, I, I will do exactly it's, that. It's, um, MSN, it's more MSNBC <laughs> than C-SPAN, I, right. I, I, I promise. Um, but first, let me, let me apologize for being wildly overdressed uh, in, in this crowd on, on campus tonight. It's that I have to play an anchorman on TV later tonight, and so uh, I, I need this costume. Uh, you know, when I was... When I was um, thinking about 
what I wanted to write about. Uh, I, because of my West Wing years, I, I, I was just, I, I was thinking about it in dramatic terms. I was, I was just looking for the most dramatic true story that I could tell in American politics and that I felt that I could tell. And that is the 1968 election. Uh, indescribably uh, the most dramatic uh, political campaign of my lifetime and, and probably of, in American history when you consider all of the elements of it. Uh, you know, the last presidential campaign people think of as being this wild thing, and it really wasn't. It was a bunch of perfectly sensible candidates who felt their time had come hiring professional staff to run professional campaigns in a kind of a corporate and organized and serious way. And then there was one very idiosyncratic <laughs> candidate, but just one, that was it. There's just one oddity, in, and of course, that's the one who went all the way. But in 1968, you had an incumbent president who'd been elected in a landslide in 1964, who was presumed to be cruising to re-election uh, when the year, the year began. And uh, Gene McCarthy decides to do something we'd never seen before. He decides as a Democrat that he's going to challenge his own party's incumbent president and run for president in order to put the Vietnam War on the ballot. Gene McCarthy had no expectation of winning. He just wanted to get the war on the ballot as the peace candidate and, and let the peace movement express itself in electoral politics. That was the, the pebble that started rolling down the mountain that created this great avalanche that we saw, uh, it, it, that we saw unfold in that year. Uh, Gene McCarthy goes up to New Hampshire. He does very well in New Hampshire. I thought he won New Hampshire because like Jim, I was a high school kid kind of consuming this stuff on TV. He came in a very, very strong second, but the excitement about how well he did there was just uh, overwhelming in the news media. Days later, Bobby Kennedy jumps into the campaign as another peace candidate, and so now the Democratic president is being challenged by two <coughs> Democrats. Uh, this is, again, just unheard of that this would be happening. Uh, and then the all-powerful incumbent president who was considered the most ruthless, the most effective, uh, the toughest politician in America simply quits, simply drops out of the campaign uh, and leaves the field to, uh, to Bobby Kennedy and to Gene McCarthy. Uh, and then the country just goes through a series of disastrous sequences and violent sequences. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. Uh, that produces a couple of weeks of rioting in this country like we had not seen before that and this horrible kind of flooding of our streets with military personnel and others to try to control this situation. Uh, then uh, six weeks after that, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated. Uh, then the vice president, Hubert Humphrey, jumps into the campaign, uh, basically trying to take up the space that would have been Lyndon Johnson's. And, and Hubert Humphrey comes to Chicago, where he gets the nomination, without having entered a single primary. That's how unimportant the primary system was back then, in relative terms. But it had turned out to show how important it could be because it was the launching pad for the McCarthy candidacy, for the Bobby Kennedy candidacy. Uh, Hubert Humphrey then goes on to face Richard Nixon, who was predictably uh, on his way to that Republican nomination, and he got it. But to get there, he had to completely destroy what was left of liberalism in the Republican Party, and, and literally the last liberal standing on a Republican convention stage uh, was in 1968 when the mayor of New York, John Lindsay, uh, was given the duty of seconding the nomination of Spiro Agnew to be the vice president. Uh, that, that's, that's where the liberals in the Republican Party found themselves uh, by 1968. Uh, and, and, you know, Nixon then goes on to this win. Uh, which he, and he wins by less than 1% of the vote. So if you change anything in this campaign, if you give Hubert Humphrey one more day 
uh, he probably wins because the, the momentum was with Humphrey as he was closing. Uh, and the final piece of the campaign that Nixon believed he needed, and he always believed he needed, was he needed the Vietnam War to be going, and to be going very badly on election day. Because he was running with this notion that he had a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. And he ran much like Trump in that he n tried to be as unspecific as possible. Uh, his position on Vietnam was whatever the Democrats said was wrong. That was his position. He never really said what he really wanted to do. And so he established a secret channel of communication with a foreign government and colluded with a foreign government to make sure the Vietnam War was still going on election day. He used secret communication with the South Vietnamese to tell them to not cooperate with President Johnson, who was moving toward uh, peace talks in Paris. And he got the South Vietnamese to pull out of those peace talks. This is all documented. The FBI discovered it in wiretaps. The CIA brought it to the president. Uh, president Johnson knew about it about a week before the election. And he was torn about going public with this and telling voters, this is what the Republican candidate is doing. He's interfering with the peace talks. And he's colluding with a foreign government uh, in order to win this election. But the cooler heads around him in the White House uh, insisted that he couldn't do that because it would compromise intelligence sources. Uh, and they feared it would look blatantly political, as if LBJ was just trying to hurt Nixon and help Humphrey. Uh, and so Nixon got away with what really was the perfect crime. It was a perfect crime because when LBJ caught him, LBJ ultimately realized, even though I've caught him, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, and that's how we got Richard Nixon in 1968. Uh, but the, the story from beginning to end includes so many other twists and turns and minor details that I had no idea about uh, when I was just a kid watching it on TV. And, uh, and, and this book brings you into those rooms, especially those back rooms, where all those characters live and all those details are revealed. Now that was so expansive, so uncable like. Was that two I, minutes? Now I feel like Brian Lamb on right. C SPAN. Right. Um, that was terrific. Um, Robert Kennedy, um, brother of uh, assassinated president, uh, attorney general under John F. Kennedy, moves to New York, runs for Senate, wins. Uh, hems and haws a little bit, decides to run the Democratic nomination. Purely speculative. What, throw out a notion, what might have happened if he had not been assassinated? What would have happened first in the Democratic primary? And Lawrence is right, there were very few. Uh, and then possibly one on one against Nixon. Well, they pretty much got into the end of the primary schedule. Bobby Kennedy won California, and, and in, when he was up there on the stage uh, accepting that victory, uh, there was an assassin standing in, in the hall, and because he went off the stage in this direction, he walked straight to the assassin who was able to shoot him at very close range. And the original plan was actually for him to walk out this way, but there was a change of plans at the last minute because there was some reporters over there he was going to talk to. And so just if Bobby Kennedy had walked off the stage according to the original plan, uh, having studied it uh, as closely as I have now, I believe Bobby Kennedy would have come here to Chicago and gotten the nomination. And that's for two reasons. Uh, one is Hubert Humphrey was an absolutely terrible, terrible candidate. And he was really scaring the Democratic powers that be about how terrible a candidate he was. And I mean his performance on stage, his performance in front of a microphone. Uh, and this was someone who, not that long ago, had been a really spirited candidate and was one of the great leading liberals of the Democratic Party. But he had been so tied to Lyndon Johnson and was so locked into the Lyndon Johnson approach to Vietnam that he couldn't even really talk about the most important issue in the campaign, which was Vietnam. And so the pros were watching the Humphrey campaign just sink and, and just never really get off the ground. Uh, none of them liked Gene McCarthy. He was just a renegade, and, and he was outside of the establishment, and they thought he was way too flaky, and none of the establishment was going to do business with Gene McCarthy. But Bobby Kennedy was 
the establishment. He was the establishment running against the establishment. And many of the people who would decide uh, this nomination here in Chicago had been Kennedy people. They had made his brother the nominee. Bobby was the campaign manager for his brother in 1960. He dealt with all of these people. And so I believe the way the, the, the summer would have unfolded is by the time we got to Chicago, there would have been enough doubt about Humphrey's ability to win in November uh, that this convention would have gone with Bobby Kennedy. And I think Bobby Kennedy uh, would have beaten Nixon. I mean, you know, Humphrey came uh, within a percentage point of beating Nixon. Uh, Bobby was a better candidate. The, the backdrop for that year was so obviously the Vietnam War, and it, it may be a little difficult for the students here to fully appreciate how this permeated everything. Dinner conversations, whether you're on the Upper West Side of Manhattan or in Peoria, Illinois, were you know parents and kids perhaps dueling over this increasingly unpopular war, and in ways we didn't fully appreciate, you know, in the White House, in the West Wing. Um, this very talented legislator turned sort of accidental president agonizing over um, what to do. Um, as the Ken Burns series recently reminded us, um, that the, the, the te in the Tet Offensive, the fabled Tet Offensive, militarily the U.S. actually defeated the North and the Viet Cong. What, can you also speculate if Johnson had just been more effective in selling uh, you know, what had, had really happened, might that have had any impact on that campaign? No, I, I don't think there was a way to sell what was happening in 1968. Uh, so if we gathered in this room in 1968, this group, every single person here would know someone who, would know someone either who was in Vietnam or was facing the prospect of going to Vietnam within the next year or two. You would have a draft card in your pocket. That draft card would determine ultimately whether you were sent to Vietnam and possibly sent to Vietnam to die. Everyone in your family would be worried about that draft card in your pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that, your girlfriend would be worried about it. You, d you didn't have to have the draft card yourself to be worried about it. Uh, just just as an order of magnitude understanding of this. In the entire 21st century, the entire 21st century of our military engagements in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East, roughly 6,400 uh, American soldiers have been lost there, 6,000. In the year 1968 alone, over 16 thousand just in that year. 16,000 families in America had military funerals in 1968. Uh, my cousin Johnny was killed in 1968. He graduated from West Point in 1967, uh, did combat training, uh, went over there and lasted about 90 days. Uh, and that was just another day in the life of America uh, in 1968. And so there wasn't a way to to tell those families uh, that what they lost in Vietnam uh, was lost in service to progress that was being made there because the Tet Offensive certainly, uh, what the Tet Offensive did show, no matter who you know, did the scoring of it, was that uh, the North Vietnamese were capable of much more than the generals, the American generals were saying they were capable of. They, were, they had been saying prior to the Tet Offensive that that kind of thing could never happen. Uh, and so, and you know, my cousin Johnny's father was a general who also went to West Point. Uh, he, as a general uh, in 1968, uh, believed that this was unwinnable, that it was unwinnable, that the American military did not have tactics that could win there. Uh, and this is after the Tet Offensive. And so it wasn't just a matter of salesmanship and it wasn't a matter of battle for battle, how did we score you know, on, on body counts uh, because what was happening here uh, with an extremely active anti-war movement that had, had now grown up uh, and was supporting the protest against this war is uh, you know, those caskets were coming back at a rate that is unimaginable today.
It's a good point, too, about everybody, even kids' familiarity with somebody who was there. I just remember that I was a high school kid uh, going to a private school in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I corresponded for years, wrote letters, world before the internet, with a middle school teacher who was born to the manor and rich at birth from Lake Forest, Illinois, from the Armour family, the meatpacking family, who wound up as, you know, going to liberal arts school in the East and wound up teaching mostly these rich kids in this private school. And then, I think he even volunteered for the Marines and so dealt with him. And here was a guy who felt, you know, very forcefully uh, that this was the right fight. And, and mm -hmm. those, you know, there were those people too and um, came back and over the years, like most everybody else, said, oh my gosh, what folly was this? Before we get to, ultimately, to me, maybe the most intriguing and complex character in that campaign, Richard Nixon, there was the sort of important ancillary figure of George Wallace. Speak a little bit about Wallace and the extent to which you see governor of a southern state um, associated by us northern liberals with the racism and discrimination. Um, speak just a little bit about him and any sort of likeness you see in that campaign with the one that Donald Trump ran. Well, you know, I, I interviewed uh, George Wallace's 1968 campaign manager dur in 2016 during the Trump campaign. And he said that when he listened to Donald Trump, he was hearing George Wallace. Uh, that everything that, that Trump was doing, uh, he had seen before on the campaign stage when Wallace was out there. Uh, Wallace, by the way, was the guy who invented the campaign phrase, law and order, uh, for Republicans and for that side of our politics. And uh, when he invented it, uh, he actually, what he was saying, he, he said this to reporters in 1967, <laughs> He said, I don't talk about segregation anymore, I talk about law and order. And that was really important because what Wallace understood was there was a way for him to communicate that let's go backwards uh, concept uh, <clears throat> phrased by Trump as make America great again, that let's go backwards concept without using the actual words of the past like segregation at that point. And, and so, uh, so, and, and another just behavioral characteristic as campaigners, uh, George Wallace would get up there on a stage, and there's a vivid scene in the book of him doing this at Dartmouth College uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, and of course, he's at this Ivy League school, and he's getting all sorts of hecklers, and there's a bunch of hippies uh, you know, in the audience who are yelling at him and shouting at him, and Wallace loved that. He understood that the heckler, the person attacking him, was invaluable to him because he would then attack them back and yell at them and call them communists and call them pinkos. And what he knew he was doing is he was showing his supporters who he hated. He hated these people for you. I'm doing, I'm saying to them what you want to say to them. You cut to 2016, and there's a presidential candidate up on the stage, and he's pointing at his hecklers, and he's saying, I'd like to punch him in the mouth. Uh, this is pure Wallace stuff uh, that Trump was doing up there. He knew the value of those hecklers. I mean, he didn't have to, but he would have imported some of those uh, into, those uh, into those rallies of his so he could have the tough guy moment with the heckler. At the same time, though, you'll concede this was a guy who had a certain level of competence when it came to government, having been through the system, having been the governor of a state, a, a, a competence arguably far superseding that of Donald Trump. Then we come to Nixon, where, I mean, in some ways, not many parallels. This is a guy who knew what the job was. He had been vice president for eight years. He had been congressman from California. Uh, he had run for California for governor and lost, obviously. By today's standards, Republican standards, a distinct liberal, um, ends up winning and brings into office lots of extremely, extremely competent people. And along the way, for some of the, the same reasons that we've tainted him, gives us this astonishing window onto an American presidency by the illegal taping 
of everybody in the, in, in the Oval Office. And if you want students, you can go online now and listen to 3,000 hours of tapes about the daily workings, stuff that David would matter-of-factly know about from his experience with Obama. But if we ask David about a certain meeting, we've got to probably believe what David says, as opposed to going online and hearing the actual voices and the tinkling of the glasses and the drunken tirades. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable. What about Nixon v. Trump? Uh, well, Nixon is just a, an incredible sophisticate compared to Trump. However, <laughs> however, they both they both have a a common characteristic that is their downfall. Richard Nixon was, by an order of magnitude, the most bitter human being in American politics by the time you get to 1968 and for a significant period of time before that. He always felt as if he wasn't given his due. That is Trump's life story. Trump always knew there were bigger, more important you know, real estate guys in New York, and he was always jealous of them. He was always jealous of real billionaires. Trump had an image of himself uh, that he could never achieve, uh, and he knew uh, that the, the right people know that he's not what he says he is. Nixon believed that he was worthy uh, of being regarded a certain way, but believed that the, you know, what he thought of as the Harvard, New York Times, you know, Northeast complex uh, of liberals, and he would always say Jews, uh, were never going to give him his due. Uh, and, and, you know, we saw this incredibly bitter moment. He was the first, 1960, Richard Nixon was the very first vice president in history to lose a presidential campaign, the very first. Uh, and he lost it to this glamour boy, you know, who kind of, in his view, came from out of nowhere and wasn't as experienced as he was. He then, in 1962, goes on to run for governor of California. And he exits, when he loses that race, he exits the stage in the most bitter scene we have ever seen uh, in American politics, where he says very, very bitterly to the reporters who have gathered that day, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Uh, and a certain sector of America rejoiced that they wouldn't have <laughs> Nixon to kick around anymore, but turns out he wasn't telling the truth. And so he kind of um, pretty immediately started plotting his way to the next, the next Republican presidential nomination that would be worth having in his mind, which was the 68, not the 64. Uh, he knew that the 64 was going to be a landslide for LBJ after the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, and so letting Barry Goldwater have that nomination was fine by him, but he was spending every day of 64 uh, playing with that campaign in a way that would enable him to get, get well launched for 68, and, and it worked. Uh, he carried that bitterness with him uh, to, to the point uh, that, that, you know, first of all, you know, he, he, he didn't trust anyone around him. He didn't, didn't trust anyone, uh, including the people who worked for him. You know, he hired Henry Kissinger but didn't trust Henry Kissinger as a human being. Uh, and that lack of trust is what sent him in his criminal ways. Richard Nixon was criminally inclined. He had a criminal's heart in the moments when it counted, and that is his biggest similarity with Donald Trump, is that, you know, that, 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 that spirit of, there must, is there a way to steal this thing? If there is, then I will steal this thing. And, and that's ultimately why you know, Richard Nixon was driven from office on the verge of impeachment, and why Gerald Ford granted him a pardon, which, which Nixon knew as a lawyer if he accepted it was an admission of guilt, and Nixon did accept it and did admit his guilt in the acceptance of that pardon. And so uh, the, 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 we are now, for the you know, first time since Nixon, uh, on a track of special prosecutor investigation that leads in to very similar channels. I mean, we, we had one before under Clinton, which was about completely different stuff. Uh, this is a very similar kind of investigation that, that Nixon got himself into, and it, it is the essence of the men to, to 
basically lead them lead themselves into those holes. I just um, I just realized I'll try where we met, and I now realize we met on in a television studio many Fridays in Washington D.C. Uh, on the McLaughlin Group um, itself. You know now probably forgotten by you know, a lot of folks, but uh, in some ways, path-breaking, melding of entertainment and time serious policy um, discussions, which leads me to talking about what you learned and came away with um, in looking at the 68 campaign when it comes to media coverage. Just as a reminder for, uh, you know, David's students at the Institute, uh, and maybe underscoring the obvious in some ways, but it's a world before laptops, cell phones, cable television. Um, you know, there wasn't live coverage anywhere you wanted it online of every single, of, of 83 different appearances on a given day by candidates in New Hampshire. Um, you actually, even if you were an elite reporter, you sort of waited breathlessly to see what the New York Times, for instance, was going to have the next morning. It kind of drove the agenda. Fast forward now to the world in which you're involved in, and you've got so-called embeds, you know, younger reporters with every single campaign who are not only tweeting but sending out live video. And in fundamental ways, if you agree, speak to how this has altered the whole business of coverage. That world is sort of gone when you had four, five, six hours to maybe thoughtfully come up with a piece. That world is now gone where if you were an elite reporter, um, maybe make it hard for your editor to contact you uh, and maybe at best give him the phone number of a restaurant you were going to be at in two hours in Manchester. And then when the you know, maitre d' came over to say, Mr. Warren or Mr. Margolis or whatever, you know, you had your decision of whether or not to talk with your boy. That's all different. Mm -hmm. Speak to what you learned in going back to 68 about media coverage, good, bad, or indifferent. Well, you know, I wish I could say it was better <coughs> now. Um, but it, it's fascinating because I, I, one thing I had to do a lot of was read uh, a certain day's New York Times coverage of the campaign or the Washington Post coverage of the campaign. And, it, and I get to read that article now with the knowledge of everything that was really happening behind the scenes. And I got to say, the reporting was really great. There's, there's just some really uh, amazing dispatches that these reporters came up with that really, that really did capture the truth of what was happening uh, in the back room behind closed doors. But you know, three, exactly three television networks, that's it. ABC, NBC, CBS. That's all we had, uh, and and you know a, a short nightly news broadcast on each one of them, half hour. That was it. That was TV news in America, uh, and so uh, it it was a very very different game, and that's why newspapers were so important, is because TV news actually was not beating newspapers, uh, you know, the way TV news does now. I mean, if a story comes out at 7 p.m., then you know TV news has it at 7 p.m. and everybody's talking about it on, on, on cable news. Uh, in, the, in those days, if the story came out at 7 p.m., no one was going to know about it until the next morning's newspaper. Uh, and so that rhythm was completely different. You know? and, and campaigns would have sometimes 12-hour you know, periods in which to think up, what are we going to say? when the New York Times prints X tomorrow, uh, as opposed to now, where it's going to get tweeted instantaneously, and you have 30 seconds to figure out you know, what you're going to say. Uh, there was also a certain amount of, uh, of, of backstage uh, border crossings with reporters. Uh, Mary McGrory is in this book in a very significant way. Uh, and I, as a kid, knew her as a Boston Globe columnist, Washington-based Boston Globe columnist. And in the research, I discover uh, she was, uh, not surprisingly, very close to uh, Democratic uh, politicians, and in particular, the Irish Catholic politicians. She was Irish Catholic herself. So she was a real, uh, real pal of Jean McCarthy and a real pal of Bobby Kennedy and Teddy Kennedy. And she actually worked at certain points uh, 
during those t when those two campaigns were running as an intermediary, as an ambassador, <laughs> trying to make peace uh, with these two campaigns and, and having messages passed uh, between them through Mary McGrory. And, uh, and, and that's something now that would be considered just completely you know, a violation of all uh, journalistic ethics. Uh, you know, by the more traditional uh, journalists as opposed to some of the political operatives who have turned into commentators at different networks. I think some of those conversations might still go on. But uh, so, so the, the media, what I can say about the media's presentation of the 1968 campaign with a tiny fraction of the resources that we bring to campaigns now in, in media was ultimately much more accurate a picture uh, of what was happening day to day in that campaign. And the range of, um, of disagreement uh, in the media about what happened yesterday was basically zero, meaning uh, those were the days where you were, the editorial page of your paper was certainly entitled to its own opinion, but the reporting page was not entitled to its own facts. And so, you know, these conservative-owned uh, newspapers were reporting pretty much the same stuff that the liberal-owned newspapers were reporting, and they differed only on the editorial page. That's absolutely fascinating, not what I necessarily expected. So on one hand, right, the volume of information, the volume of smart people, the Larry O'Donnells, the David Axelrods, who may be on in a given evening sort of reflecting, is by leaps and bounds greater, but you're suggesting we're not necessarily, not necessarily better informed about what may have happened on a given day in Iowa or New Hampshire or whatever. Yeah, we're not. And if you were to look at, uh, you know, meet the press back in those days, uh, where you had, in those days, it was uh, three reporters sitting there, you know, uh, grilling the candidate or whoever the guest was. Um, you know, that, all that questioning was happening, you know, within a fairly well-defined uh, set of boundaries, um, but it, it all, uh, it, it was all pointed in the direction of what everyone agreed was relevant in a campaign. And tonight, you know, you can flip uh, through the cable channels and you're going to hear stories about, you know, uh, someone in the FBI texting his girlfriend about something that is, that someone's going to interpret as the most serious threat to democracy in our history. And then <laughs> on another channel, that won't be mentioned as having occurred. And you know, so, so we have this um, kind of tower of battle that's developed. Um, since we're on a campus, um, talk a little bit about what the culture of American campuses back in 68, the, the true huge amount of tumult, uh, primarily due to the war. And, and I assume that folks on this and other campuses these days, uh, with issues such as sex harassment and others, un undoubtedly have some sense of, of, of ferment and uh, perhaps a society unraveling. But it was pretty different. Well, the 1960s. Uh, was the most dramatic change decade in American culture in our history. Uh, because, you know, we, we began the 1960s with a set of agreements about how the world is supposed to work. Uh, we ended the 1960s with almost none of those agreements. Uh, and so for college life, for campus life, uh, let's just look at, say, uh, uh, a place like Harvard, which say in 1966, there's a dress code, and the me the, these men students have to wear neckties. <clears throat> they have to wear suit coats to class, to to meals. Uh, 1966. By 1969, not only is there not a dress code. They have rioted and they have taken over the president's office and they're occupying it for days. And the question is, do we arrest them and send them to jail or do we expel them or what do we do and how do we make peace and how do we get them out of there without clubbing them all the way we saw the Chicago police handle these same kinds of protesters 
during the Democratic Convention of 1968. Uh, by 1970, you have uh, gender-integrated dormitories at Harvard College. This is a speed of cultural change that is absolutely <laughs> unimaginable uh, at, at any other time. Uh, and so, and within that campus life, you know, one of the reasons that dress codes are being thrown away is that there's a, there's a spirit of revolt uh, on campuses that is coming from the anti-war movement. Uh, and, and it is questioning everything because to question an American war while it was underway simply was not done. We never had a real anti-war movement during any of America's wars prior to the 1960s, beginning in a really serious way, getting really serious in 1967. And so these people, to stand up and say, uh, uh, as they were saying by 1968, America is in an immoral and illegal war that it cannot win, and we should end it now and get out of there. Every single component of that sentence was unthinkable in 1963 and in 1964. Unthinkable and unsayable, just unsayable. Uh, and so when you're overthrowing as they were, something as uh, a, 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 that, that has been completely unquestioned, like America's approach to war, when you're overthrowing all of that as an 18-year-old or as a 19-year-old sophomore in college, the dress code doesn't have much longer. <laughs> um, we're going to go to, in about two, three minutes, to questions in the audience, first from students, but a um, final one that results from um, my wife lying in bed and got downing uh, downloading from Netflix and binging on a show called um, Grace and Frank, Frankie? Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. Jane Fonda, who apropos to this commercial, is, is, is in the news with, it's beyond irony, Megyn Kelly from Fox going to liberal NBC, <laughs> and, now, and, it, and, it, and, and NBC sitting there happy as ratings are going up as she is bad-mouthing Hanoi Jane. I mean, I, this, it's a level of irony I, I can't quite <laughs> comprehend. But um, so I watched that, and, and Sam Waterston and Martin Sheen play uh, the ex-husbands who turn out, and they're now gay and they're married. And I, I do have a difficult time, partly because of Larry, of, uh, of watching Martin Sheen. Because my wife, um, you know, liberal from Evanston, Illinois, had previously been binging, like many, many, many other Americans, on the West Wing. Explain, and it may be as simple as two words, Donald Trump, what it is that the two of us sat there watching episode after episode as if this had been real. Yeah. yeah. And going, oh my gosh, with waves of nostalgia every night before one of us, we both fell asleep, forgot to turn off the lights. Well, the West Wing is enjoying a gigantic resurgence on, next, on Netflix, thanks to Netflix, and I suppose thanks to Donald Trump, because what I'm hearing anecdotally is people are turning to it, uh, if, if not intentionally at the beginning, it, it, it ends up being uh, as a kind of medicine. Uh, for this era, as, as uh, they're, they're turning to it to escape the real presidency and then to reimagine uh, what they want the presidency to be. And that's really what Aaron Sorkin was writing when, when Aaron wrote the pilot, was he was writing the presidency that he wanted to see and had never seen. He had never uh, really admired uh, a presidency the way he wanted to admire this one. And, uh, and it was a little bit of a strain for me. I was one of the, the first writer hired uh, when they went to episodes and they needed to have a writing staff because I had come out of real governing and real politics in Washington. And so I was very uncomfortable with these people choosing to do the right thing. And um, this was taking fiction a little too far for me. And so my general, my, my contribution to the show, especially in the episodes that I wrote alone, uh, was that uh, I would only let them do the right thing after they tried everything else, uh, <laughs> including the dirtiest thing. Like, they won't get away with it, you know. And so, so they would end up telling the truth just because they felt they couldn't get away with anything else. Um, 
But what I'm hearing now is that, is that people are watching it and feeling uh, a, a nostalgia, uh, not just for a world where that could happen, uh, but a hope that that, that will return uh, to those halls of the West Wing. And I have to tell you, it was, it was fascinating for me to, to go to work on that show because, you know, when you build a set, um, sets are n almost never physically accurate. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you're building a set and it has to be someone's house, you know, you have the kitchen over there and then you have, you know, the garage here and the living rooms there and it, it makes no architectural sense whatsoever, mm -hmm. but the way we play with the cameras, it all works. The West Wing set was built in a layout that was accurate. Meaning, you know, the Roosevelt Room's here, the Oval Office is there, uh, and so I knew my way around the West Wing set because I knew my way around the West Wing. And so on day one, I knew where everything was, uh, and, and it was really extraordinary. And this was the, you know, there's now been many, many uh, Oval Office sets uh, built uh, in LA since then. Uh, but the Oval Office had only appeared very rarely uh, in some films uh, from time to time. And so we had, uh, at Warner Brothers for a few years, the only Oval Office uh, in LA. And I have to tell you, the building itself, the, even, in, even in its fictional form on the Warner Brothers lot, that oval has an effect on people, and it had an effect on Martin, and it had an effect on actors, it had an effect on carpenters, on electricians, that there was something very important happening here, even in our fictional version. And that I know is what David Axelrod and everyone else who's ever worked in the West Wing, anyone who's ever worked in the Senate, anyone who's ever had the honor uh, of having you know, a security pass that allows them to move through all of that, that in your workday, you cannot escape the awe of the place that you're in and the, the weight that you carry. And, and that, I think, was effectively conveyed by the West Wing. There's a lot of other things in it where we played with the edges of reality and we stretched it a little bit here and there, to put it mildly. But that basic feel, when you look at Allison Janney and Richard Schiff and Brad Whitford and Janelle Maloney and Dulé Hill and, and these actors occupying their space in that set, they are feeling what David Axelrod was feeling in his office in the West Wing and they are conveying that to the audience and that's what I think is ultimately its, its most important gift to the audience is that feeling. We're now gonna go to audience question first few from students. And um, if you might just um, identify yourself, where are you from? Mr. O'Donnell, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Ronan Shatsky, and I'm a second year student uh, here in the college. I'm from New York City originally. So I wanted to ask you, you know, many people talk about the 2016 election as you know, the moment the white working class left the Democratic Party. But of course, it was actually just a, like a, the culmination of a, several decades of those voters leaving the party, starting around the 1968 election. And this, of course, included the South switching from being a Democratic stronghold to being you know, only Republicans were winning. So I'm wondering if you could talk about the way in which the 1968 election was, in some sense, a coalition redefining year, and the ways in which Democrats and Republicans were running that race mindful of the ways that their constituencies were shifting, if they were mindful. And actually also, if there are any lessons from that in terms of the current debate about whether the Democrats should try to pursue these voters they've lost or if they should move on. Yeah, the, in 68, the most interesting campaign that was aware of what you're talking about was the Kennedy campaign. The Gene McCarthy campaign was launched as a single issue campaign. It was launched as an anti-war campaign. And it took quite a while for Gene McCarthy to start talking about anything other than the war. Bobby Kennedy was the campaign that was launched as an anti-war campaign uh, and also as a campaign for the working class, as a, as a traditional Democratic Party uh, union-backed uh, and union-supporting 
campaign. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was also talking about urban policy, urban social policy, poverty policy. It took Gene McCarthy quite a while to catch up with Bobby Kennedy in talking about poverty at all. Uh, and so, and, and meanwhile, on the Republican side, the challenge uh, that Nixon saw was purely an electoral college challenge. It was with George Wallace in this race, uh, how do I get the electoral college uh, if he's going to take some southern states away from me? And how do I compete uh, with George Wallace in the southern states? Because what they all knew at that point was, uh, as Lyndon Johnson had said when he signed the Civil Rights Act and the, and the Voting Rights Act, that the South will be lost to the Democrats for a generation. Turns out it's been lost for longer uh, than a generation. And so on the Republican side, it was, a, it was much simpler in that there wasn't a set of um, you know, possibly conflicting uh, coalitions, but certainly coalitions uh, who needed to hear their issues addressed very specifically, and those issues had nothing to do uh, you know, with, with another set of issues that another coalition needed. But, but 68 really was that moment in the Democratic Party where you could really start to very vividly identify what have become these different factions that exist today. And on the, the Republican side, something your book did a terrific job reminding me of, you know, at the 68 convention in Miami, you got these figures, you mentioned uh, John Lindsay, but there were these two guys, George Romney and Nelson Rockefeller, who were players yeah. in the Republican Party. You know, uh, Rockefeller, maybe the last of the, the great North, well, Republican moderates who might have won uh, the nomination against Barry Goldwater if it weren't for a rough couple of weeks before the California primary involving his personal life. Yeah, at the beginning uh, of the campaign year of 68, certainly in late 67, George Romney and Nelson Rockefeller were considered possible front runners for the Republican nomination. They were both liberals, and they were liberals by anyone's definition at the time. Uh, and and you know, Nixon knew that that was his challenge in the early primaries is, you know, how do I knock out the liberals? It turns out uh, the liberals were very good at knocking themselves out. Uh, Romney ended up stumbling out of the campaign, uh, turned out to, to mess up quite a bit uh, before it even got started. Rockefeller was uh, the most indecisive uh, candidate, potential candidate I've ever seen. Uh, he would think, I'm going to do it, then he'd think, I'm not going to do it. He went back and forth. By the time he decided to do it, it was way too late. And so they, had, they just left, the liberals in the party just ended up leaving the lane open for Nixon, uh, and it was way too late. They, they, by the time they got to Miami Beach, uh, it, was, it was hopeless, it seemed to me, as I was watching it on TV as a kid, but once I got into the drama of it, it turns out uh, they did a really interesting job of making Richard Nixon very nervous that week, but ultimately he got the nomination. And, and just in case, there are a couple of, you know, Rockefeller, governor of New York, and Romney, yes, the dad of, the Romney that you know, governor of Michigan. Uh, next. Thank you for being here and congratulations on the book. Um, my question is, a, well, I, th I think we can all agree that the 1968 election is still really important today, really impactful, um, and it's important for people in my generation to be talking about, even if we haven't necessarily lived the history. So. My question is, do you have any thoughts on how to facilitate intergenerational dialogue on these events from the past that are so important um, between people who lived them and the people who should be understanding them today, too? That's a great question. It is a great question. I think books are great for this. Um, I would say the younger generation that didn't live through it should read a book about it. Um, uh -huh. And then the dialogue starts, you know, because then you get to ask your, you know, grandparents or your parents, well, where were you? What did you do? And what, how did, what was that like? What was, it, how did you get out of the draft? Uh, what, what number did you get in the draft lottery? Mm -hmm. There's so much real human detail about this that is sparked just, just by that question. You know, what number did you get in the draft lottery? Uh, you know, you, you ask my brother Bill that, and you, you don't get to talk for the next 15 minutes. And, he, and it's fascinating. I mean, everything he tells you about his life, because he got uh, 
a high number and knew the second the lottery was done that he was never going to be drafted because his number was so high. And, and I had kind of forgotten that because I had a lower number and, and I knew I was exposed. And, uh, and so I, I'd kind of forgotten that whole other way you could live when you knew you weren't being threatened. Um, but it's, so it's a very, uh, it, it, there's a lot of really important personal experience uh, that's worth knowing about that people went through in that period. And they're still with us, and we're going to be with you for about another 20 years. <laughs> and then it's over, then we're gone. Uh, so you ask us now, because uh, time's running out. Uh, next. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Colby. I'm a first year here at the college from California. Uh, it seems to me that this president has weaponized fear in a very powerful way, right? Making voters afraid of things that are based in racism and sexism and elitism is an important tool in his arsenal. And hearing you talk about 68, it certainly sounds like much of that played a role there, right? Phrases mm -hmm. like law and order that yeah. we still use to this day, that were meant to suggest something ominous to voters, segregation now, segregation forever. My question is, you know, how do you think fear played a role in 68? How did it change our national dialogue, the republic, and where do we see echoes of that today? Well, fear was a huge part of it, uh, and including the fearful reaction to uh, urban rioting that we saw in, in 1968. Uh, and, and that, you know, Nixon knew that he was the beneficiary. He was watching the Democratic Convention on TV, and he was watching the rioting, uh, you know, and he turned to his staff, and they just couldn't believe how lucky they were. They, they couldn't believe. Uh, that this was happening because they knew the spectacle that the country's watching uh, the Democrats create as far, you know, as far as they were concerned in Chicago was something that could only benefit uh, Nixon because, you know, the, they felt in simplistic terms that, uh, you know, the way to vote against what you're seeing in Chicago is to vote for the Republican uh, Richard Nixon. And so it, it, was, it was very much of a fear-based the whole, the whole law and order concept uh, and that phrase is a fear-based phrase. The, in it is the notion that law and order has collapsed, that the crime is running wild in the streets and that rioters and looters are doing whatever they want uh, because someone is allowing them to. And that must be liberalism or that must be the current government, you know, Lyndon Johnson's Democratic Party government, look what this gets you. Uh, and so you need us you know, to contain this. And so the extent to which Nixon echoed Wallace uh, on the law and order concept uh, was extremely important to that campaign because that's uh, saying, I'm gonna crack down on those people. You know, those people that you see out there uh, in that uh, newsreel about, you know, the rioting that occurred, I'm gonna crack down on them. I am gonna stop them from threatening the way you live in this country. So. So in those days, um, you know, the, the whole, the, the, the ISIS threat, uh, that, that threat to the way of life in America was internal. It was, uh, it's people within this country who are threatening your safety and threatening the way you live. And we, the Republicans, we, Richard Nixon, I'm gonna stop that. And, and that, uh, you know, that, that, the, that template is, is basically what you what you saw operating in 2016. So um, <clears throat> I was a student in 1968, and my draft number was 366. Oh, you were safe. How was how was that for lucky? Yeah. Um, my question is, how do you think the end of the the draft has impacted America? Uh, well, the good news is you live in a country where the government does not have physical control over your body uh, such that it can basically seize you and send you off to die in a distant war or send you to prison if you refuse to do that or uh, force you into the decision of fleeing to Canada or Sweden to escape that fate. So that's, that's the good part of the story. Um, the, in, the inevitable negative outcome of the removal of that universal collective threat is that uh, the, the connection to government is much more remote. Uh, so in, in 1968, uh, you know, 
kids with draft cards felt, most of them, not all of them, but most of them felt a pretty negative but incredibly important connection to government and an incredibly pressing need to change the way government was dealing with them. That removal of the draft card uh, has really deflated uh, that energy, has really deflated uh, activism, uh, and did deflate it for decades, up until this presidency where we see this resistance taking to the streets in numbers greater than anything we ever saw during Vietnam. And the, the protests we saw during Vietnam were the largest protests in the history of the United States of America until the day after Donald Trump was inaugurated. The day after. I have two questions. One, the former president of the United States is a friend of mine. And I watched his family and the way they comported themselves in the White House. And I watched Christian evangelicals call him every name under the sun. But the current occupant, who's guilty of a whole lot of things that you've even mentioned on your show, I don't understand why there is such a pass given. One one hundredth of the things that Donald Trump has done, Barack could not have done for a quarter of a quarter of a millisecond. That's one thing. The other thing, can you talk about the age of politics and journalism, when the person standing behind the podium with a presidential seal can just straight out lie, and it's straight out okay? Well, you know, I when I was. <laughs> You know, as to the evangelicals who don't believe in evolution except in their own view uh, of politicians where they have clearly evolved to the point where they are now French, uh, maybe we should think of that as a welcome turn of events, that they, if they're going to move from Puritans to French, that might be welcome. But, but um, you know, the... the the uh, Donald Trump lies. I was in New Hampshire uh, during the New Hampshire primary coverage, and I would talk to voters, and they, they'd say something about Trump, and and and, and it's very casual conversations, and you know, Mexico will pay for the wall, whatever it is, you know. And I'd say, well, you know, he's lying about that. And every single time they would mention a thing, something Trump said, and every time I would say, well, you know, he's lying about that. They never said. No, he's not lying about that. That's true. Yeah. Every single time they said, well, they all lie. Yeah. And I didn't have a comeback. I felt very bad about that. Um, the price of lying in politics, which has been with us for a very long time, that, that price really came home to us in 2016 because it had worn down voters to the point uh, of that level of either, you could either call it realism or cynicism depending on your perspective. And that opened the door for this kind of behavior uh, that Donald Trump was doing. Now, I thought about and decided not to bother with a discussion along the lines of, well, you know, when President Obama said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor, what he meant was this, 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 and this. And the reason you don't have your doctor now is not because of a violated promise by President Obama. But I realized the number of paragraphs it would take for me to pull that out of the pile of lies that they consider to be lies by American presidents or politicians, it, it's, it's an impossible task. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th that's the perception. They all lie. And I'm sorry to say, American politicians as a class have earned too much of that perception. Uh, they've actually earned it. Uh, and, and so uh, that's where they are. I mean, I know Trump voters. Uh, I know some very well in Boston where I'm from. They all think he's an idiot. They all think he's a jerk. They all think he's a vulgarian. They all think he's a fool. They all think he's not very smart. Uh, but they think he's going to be the toughest guy on the southern border, and they care about that. Um, some of them care about abortion a lot, and that just 
closes down discussion of anything else. Uh, and some of them just want tax cuts. And, and so, um, but, but lying is, has now reached a level of acceptability uh, in our politics that, that is, it's kind of like, it's that moment when, uh, you know, the cancer has spread to the vital organs. And, um, and I don't know, I'm hoping that this is a Trump era phenomenon and that you can, that we're gonna restore uh, a world in which a politician uh, will feel, will, will be desperately afraid of being caught in anything that be, can be called a lie. I mean, I remember when politicians were terribly afraid of being caught in what we call a flip-flop. Like, you know, he's not lying, he just, at one point he said he was for this and now he's for this. And, um, you know, and, and Trump has done that, you know, uh, now the wall is see-through and now the wall isn't gonna be where the, you know, when the river, if it's strong enough current, then we don't need a wall there and all that. You know, um, you know uh, politicians used to desperately fear that you could find a statement that was inconsistent with what they were saying now. And that was, that was a great thing. I mean, I used to think, well, that's, you know, why can't the voters understand that there's a reason he's changed his mind and he's evolved? Well, that's better than where we are now, you know, at least in the Trump world. And let's always remember when we talk about the Trump world, it is now a small minority of the American voter and the American public. This, is, this guy's at 35%. Most of America is against what Donald Trump wants. They are against him as a person. All the polls show that. He is a rejected president who still has uh, you know, days left in his term. He has time left in his term, but he is a rejected president by the American public. And just because he still is president, we shouldn't let the world feel and we shouldn't let Americans feel as if uh, you know, they are somehow in some strange alienated condition from this presidency, the vast majority of Americans disapprove of everything about this presidency. Okay, I've gotta be sort of the bad guy here. Uh, Larry's got a show to do, so we've got six minutes and 20 seconds left. So <laughs> maybe two more questions, but make it real brief, thanks. Okay, brief questions. Uh, first of all, I was on the street during 68 at the convention and Martin Luther King without ammunition. Nobody had ammunition, so if you're worried about that, it's over. Question, Bush had his brain, his brain, uh, Karl Rove. Who's Trump got? <laughs> he fired his brain. Uh, he's the only president to fire his brain. Uh, you know, Bannon is gone, and um, you know, I, apparently there isn't anyone. Uh, we're, apparently we're stuck with Trump's brain at this point. <laughs> Uh, sir. Uh, yes. So whenever I think of 1968, um, the first character that actually comes to my mind is LBJ. And much of my reading, he seems like the most maligned characters in those years. Yet I find him enchanting because um, he was a Dixiecrat. He was a senator. He ascended to the presidency with much hubris and, le and leverage and just tried to force through a lot of groundbreaking policy. And it seems to me, just through my readings, he was very adamant about you know, social change, social injustice, not only for minorities, but you know, just also downtrodden, I guess, white people, individuals as a whole. And it seemed his goal was to reach a point where people would be elevated to a certain extent where politicians wouldn't be able to play down one downtrodden group of people against another. And he was hoping to um, <laughs> elevate the um, elevate the citizenship to a, to a certain point where, you know, it'll be a more enlightened electorate. And I guess my question is if, and it's a big if, if he wasn't, I guess, um, maligned because of the Vietnam War and um, he was actually able to survive to the point of going forward into the 68 election, do you think, um, do you think his policies would have lasted if they would have played a major role on today's um, atmosphere, or would they have continuously been under attack against like conservative ideology? I mention this because even today in the age where you hear of um, big government, a lot of his policies are still very popular. 
and you know n nobody questions whether they should stick around. Great. Yeah, yeah, two a, minutes. Two that's minutes. a great question. Um, so let's just for the moment assume away the Vietnam War, which I'd never really thought about before. But let's just assume it away, and and look at Lyndon Johnson running for re-election in 1968. Uh, he would have won in not. It wouldn't have been a landslide like 1964, but he, he definitely would have won. And the good thing about that is that he could have done what you're talking about, uh, which is uh, to really solidify uh, in our politics and our government all the good things that he did as president in 1964 and 1965. The trouble with the real Johnson presidency is that he was already undermining those uh, gains while he was still president because of the Vietnam War. And he was underfunding and pulling funding away uh, from some of the uh, domestic advances that the Johnson administration was interested in making. And so on the domestic side of governments, governance in the Johnson White House by 1968, there was a tremendous frustration. You could no longer get uh, Lyndon Johnson interested in what he needed, to, what, what needed to be done for cities and poverty and these issues that he had been concerned about. Uh, the, and the trouble is, look, that's the job. The, the, you don't get to uh, just be, you know, the dessert chef in the White House. You have to, you get, you have to deal with the entire meal. And he was a president during wartime, and he could not have failed more miserably as a president during wartime. And uh, you know, those sixteen thousand. Uh, soldiers who died in 1968 in Vietnam, the 55,000 who died through the course of the war, died for nothing. They gained nothing. America won nothing in, in this attempt. And there were people who could see that in 1964. They could see that there was nothing to win there and that every soldier um, um, that the United States sent to his death there would be dying for nothing and no gains. And that information was available to Lyndon Johnson. And instead of being able to process it, and process it effectively and rationally, it actually just kind of drove him crazy. And he, he, sta he started to believe that maybe he'd be better at picking the bombing sites than the generals. And he, he just completely lost control, any reasonable control, of that part of his presence because the simple part of Johnson was stuck on a very, very simple and unachievable thing. And that was, he didn't want to be the first American president to lose a war. And that's all he cared about when it came to Vietnam. And because that was all he could care about, he was the president who led America into its biggest investment in what was going to be, no matter what he did, a losing war. And so he doesn't get to do just part of the job. He has to do the entire job. And his failure on that part of his job was so miserable and so complete that it, 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 it is the thing that, that I believe uh, defines his presidency uh, in a way that, that shows he was truly incapable of doing the job of president during the years he was assigned that job. He could have done it in the 1950s, he could have done it uh, after the Vietnam War, but he couldn't do it when it was given to him. Can I just say as we wrap up, and thanks very much, um, on this matter of lack of trust, I write a lot about that stuff in the inner sections of media and politics and I have a long piece in the US News and World Report today uh, just about that, but it is really reassuring tonight to um, first see the handiwork of my friend David, who just it seemed like a few days ago we were having breakfast on Grand Avenue and talking about this vision he had. See the, the result of that be to see such a large group of uh, engaged folks coming out on a cold night. And finally, I can say with metaphysical certitude, as our friend McLaughlin would have said, as the perhaps the only person in cable news history to on consecutive nights gone from being the first scheduled guest in a primetime MSNBC show to as a result of a satellite in an Albanian refugee camp going down with 30 seconds left to being the host, the emergency host of, of the show and having been fairly inept, I, I, I can assure you that we're in the presence of somebody who has really melded 
just not technical expertise, but great thoughtfulness with some of the tricky mandates uh, of that uh, biz competitive business he's in. And I want to thank Larry for making this totally enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, just as a, uh, just, just, just to, uh, just to augment uh, Jim's point, uh, and as a tribute to a trained professional, I saw him give a brilliant answer and finished two seconds before this clock <laughs> went out. So that's what years of experience will do for you. It's excellent. But, you know, I, I would only say this, which is um, great history um, is told best by people who have enthusiasm for the story. And one of the things that makes this a book worth reading and that you could see clearly here tonight is that Lawrence O'Donnell has enthusiasm for this story. So this book will be on sale. Uh, he's signed a bunch of copies. It will be on sale right outside. I think you should do yourself a service and uh, pick it up and read it. And uh, if you haven't absorbed that in this last hour and 15 minutes, you haven't been paying attention. So thank you so much uh, for coming. And thanks to Jim Warren for a great job.